Hello, everybody. So today we're gonna have uh, we're gonna start describing the first metabolic pathway in the class, and that's glycolysis, and that's very fitting. It's a universal pathway; every cell has it. It's, in fact, it's the the most ancient uh, metabolic pathway in the cell. So this is the overview of all the of all the videos that we're gonna do for glycolysis. So we're gonna start with the first one. That's the overview of the pathway. Where does it fit? in the general large organizing scheme of, uh, of uh, uh, biochemistry that we described in the last uh, videos. So just by the name, glycolysis means something is broken down. That's the, the lysis part, okay? And, and of course it's glucose that's broken down. So and every time you break down something, you're gonna start with something big and you're gonna end up with something smaller. Let me just uh, put the, the, the pointer here. So, and you kind of get the idea you're gonna be talking about a catabolic a, a, a catabolic pathway. And that's uh, is in fact uh, the case for glycolysis. Um, and when you break uh, uh, down something, usually you pick up also some, uh, some um, electrons from it, and those will find their way onto the, the uh, electron currencies NAD or NADP, and they're gonna be, um, they're gonna be getting NADH or NADPH. So in general, the food that we eat can be classified in the general scheme that you see in the grocery store. Every time you, you buy something, um, carbohydrates, of course, are the sugars. You have fats and you have protein, which have amino acids. And glucose, as, as the name implies, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a carbohydrate. And it's uh, the most common one. So, so that's the pathway we're going to be talking about. The reaction is fairly simple. To, to draw one, I mean, that's the cumulative reaction. There are actually 10 different reactions, uh, but uh, the, the grand summary of all of them can be summarized here. You start with one glucose, which has six carbons, okay? You break it down to two pyruvates. Pyruvate has three carbons. So two times three equals six, okay? Uh, so here you see again how you start, start with something big and you end up with something smaller. That's, a, that's catabolism. And the second thing you see, based on what, what I told you, is that electrons uh, are coming off glucose and they react with, the, they, they get transferred onto NAD plus. And so what you do generate is, is reducing power in the, in the form of NADH as well. Um, the third thing that you notice is that actually glycolysis generates ATP. There is a net ATP production, in fact, of two molecules of ATP. So you get your, your energy currency there from one molecule of glucose. And that, that of course, becomes very important as we, as we will discuss. If you are wondering what happens to pyruvate, uh, which is the product of uh, glycolysis, as I said, uh, well, there are many fates, one of which is to enter aerobic respiration and it gets converted to acetyl-CoA, which then enters the TCA cycle. And in, when it does so, all the electrons that are on pyruvate Will, will become NADH, okay? We'll, we'll, find, uh, we'll, we'll find their way onto NAD plus to become NADH. And then the electrons will be transferred in the, in, in the um, electron transport chain, which uh, as we briefly mentioned in the previous uh, videos, uh, will allow the cells to, uh, to charge their batteries before finally the electrons find their way onto oxygen. That's why it's, uh, uh, it's called aerobic respiration. And of course, all the NADH has been converted to NAD, NAD plus. Uh, and the product, of course, of charging the batteries, then it allows you to run the motor of the ATP synthase and make ATP. So that's a common uh, fate of pyruvate in, in many cells. Uh, and we'll describe all these reactions in detail, you know, after glycolysis. And in case you were wondering uh, where that part is, uh, that, that's here. So that's the fate of NADH. It enters the TCA cycle in oxidative phosphorylation, and the electrons eventually get transferred to oxygen to give you water. And the products, again, would be ATP and um, CO2 that you don't see here. So all the carbon from pyruvate became CO2 that you expire, and you made back uh, the NAD plus that you need. Now, it doesn't have to be aerobic respiration. Uh, here, this is back now to, to, the, to, to, the, to the redox reactions we're discussing in the delta E. Um, you know, uh, NAD has, uh, or NADP, but let's say NAD in this case, has a, the, at the half cell has a reduction potential of minus uh, um, 0.32 uh, volts. 
so minus 320 millivolts. And so it will be thermodynamically favorable uh, redox reaction would be to combine that half cell with anything that has any value higher than minus uh, 0.32. And so in fact, in nature, a lot of things uh, have that, not just oxygen. However, you do notice that oxygen is, has a very high positive E value of uh, 0.8. So you have a differential of more than a volt actually between um, uh, NADH and, and, and oxygen. So it's a very thermodynamically favorable reaction. But there are others that are also thermodynamically favorable, although not to the same degree. Okay, so uh, you know, there are some bacteria that pass it to, to iron, and that's actually pretty good. It has a pretty pretty good uh, delta E value uh, overall if, if if that's what they do. Some very common one you can see here is a, a, a fumarate respiration. So fumarate, I mean, happens even in, in your gut as we speak, okay, by E. coli, bacteria that, that live in our intestines. And the E value for fumarate is only, it's around zero, basically, all right? So, so it's, uh, it's uh, not as a great um, um, difference, but it's still favorable. And the fact that E. coli, which can also do aerobic respiration if, if it wants to, of course, in, in our guts, there is no oxygen. So uh, the option for E. coli is to do uh, fumarate respiration. And that's why it, it keeps it. I mean, it, yes, there is an option of something more efficient, but when oxygen is not around, you can switch to plan B and still um, get stuff happening. So respiration means everything, basically, not just uh, aerobic respiration where with uh, oxygen is accepted. Anything else that can accept the, the electrons from NAD8, um, then we call all that respiration. And all these things mostly happen by bacteria. Okay. In animal cells, for the most part, uh, if there is respiration, uh, you know, most cells do glycolysis and then followed by aerobic respiration or just glycolysis, as we'll see. So why oxygen is so, so important? Um, well, there was no oxygen actually uh, when life uh, appeared on this planet and uh, for quite a while, for at least a billion years or more, I mean, there was no oxygen around and they were doing, you know, chemistry shown here at, at the lower uh, rows here, not the top row, all the organisms that were around at the time, which were all sing single cell organisms. But what happened at some point is then uh, uh, the, we have the appearance of uh, photosynthetic organisms, cyanobacteria, billions of years ago. And of course, a product of photosynthesis is oxygen. And oxygen now begins to, to build up. In fact, all the source of oxygen on our planet, which is quite high in our atmosphere, it's about 20%, uh, is biogenic. I mean, it, this is because of biology of life has generated oxygen. And and, and the more photosynthesis, now photo once you hit on something like photosynthesis, you know, if, if you can do stuff from uh, from abundant sources without uh, worrying about uh, food too much, right? And so things proliferated and there was more and more oxygen that was building up. And if you can't use oxygen, you are at an advantage compared to the other organisms that, uh, you know, at the time that uh, could not uh, uh, use oxygen. So there was pressure now on everybody who could not use oxygen to start using it. Okay. So to become more efficient, get more ATP, look at the look at the delta E here, if you're gonna have oxygen, it's, it's enormous as I described, compared to something that uh, cannot use oxygen as a terminal acceptor. So, uh, you know, eukaryotes essentially became capable of doing photosynthesis, uh, sorry, of, of doing oxidative phosphorylation by grabbing some but bacterium that could do it with oxygen, and that eventually became a, um, a symbiosis. And we call that, uh, you know, vestiges of that original bacterium, we call it mitochondria, that's what it is. So, so now we can do it too. We can do aerobic respiration. And now everybody could do it. And of course, oxygen, oxygen starts uh, building up to ridiculous uh, uh, levels. And now we are uh, at the levels we are, which have been, you know, pretty stable for the last uh, 50 million years or so or more, I guess that would be maybe 300, million, 300 million years ago. All right, so so that's about aerobic respiration. What if you don't do that or any kind of respiration in that case, 
after glycolysis. What do you do with, with pyruvate? Well, you can ferment it. And we are used to fermentation uh, um, in uh, alcoholic fermentation, let's say, with, uh, with, by yeasts and other organs, but mostly by yeast. And in this case, pyruvate is converted to ethanol. So that's three carbons. Ethanol has two carbons. You get a CO2 in, in the process. And what fermentation does also is that the electrons on NADH um, are used and you regenerate an AD+. Fermentation also happens in muscle. Uh, you, we just don't produce lactate. Okay? Uh, sorry, we don't produce ethanol. We produce lactate in muscle. So there is no CO2 production uh, in, in muscle. So three carbons, three carbons. But also very importantly, the NADH that you generated in glycolysis is regenerated now to NAD+, so it can re-enter glycolysis again, right? So that uh, is the key point of fermentation. Okay? It can regenerate NAD+. If you have glycolysis alone, at some point you won't be able to do it without fermentation because uh, you will not, you're going to run out of NAD+. The only way to get glycolysis going, if you don't have a, a respiration happening, is to do fermentation, and then you can keep going forever, as, as long as, you, as there, there is food around, okay? And as long as the build-up products like lactate or ethanol don't kill you eventually. Uh, I should say that lactate, of course, is uh, causing uh, damage. I mean, every time you work hard and you have cramping and, after, uh, and pain after, after that, it's because of the lactate buildup. So the question then becomes, all right, why does yeast do it or why does muscle do it? Okay, you don't get a lot of, um, uh, you know, why don't we, why don't these organs do, uh, you know, oxidative phosphorylation and generate NAD plus in the same way? And you get a ton of ATP out. You are a muscle, okay? Uh, you want to work as hard as possible and get as much ATP uh, as possible. And, you know, you can keep doing it. You can keep eating your glucose. And as long as you can pass them on through mitochondria and everything, you can get your ATP and get an AD+. Well, so why, if you were, let's say, a muscle, I'll explain the rationale for yeast, uh, you want to do fermentation instead. Well, it's extremely um, uh, fast, and the flux through glycolysis and fermentation can be extremely high. Now, if you couple glycolysis and fermentation, let's say in muscle, we see the muscle example here, uh, we had just the numbers here, so we have two pyruvates. That's that's the reaction for glycolysis. That's the reaction for uh, for uh, uh, the chemical reaction for fermentation. You add them up, everything almost disappears, and then now you see the end product of glycolysis and fermentation, which is lactate. And here is the key part: two ATPs. Okay, so that's why muscles do it, right? Um, and to get ATP, if you couple glycolysis and fermentation together there is no net electron flow you don't see any nad nad plus here anywhere anymore okay and the unfavorable synthesis of atp is possible okay you couple something that's unfavorable we know to make atp is actually costly but you couple it to the favorable breakdown of glucose to two three carbon units in the form of lactate so you break down something um, you capture the free energy okay the available free energy and you can build up your energy currency in the form of ATP. This sort of recapitulates the principles that we had discussed in the introduction okay, uh, with metabolism. So, all right, but we had also shown this slide early on, and I, I told you the fermentation of glucose, how much is that? You can ask, okay, you, you capture some of the free energy chains, the available free energy there is only minus 56 kilocals per mole, but if you actually take it through oxidative phosphorylation and aerobic respiration, you get more than 10 times that. So why bother with fermentation when you can do this and it's so much more efficient? After all, muscles do it. Why do they do it? I mean, that doesn't make sense, right? Well, it may appear inefficient. If you just compare how much energy you get, it appears inefficient if you compare the net output of free energy chains, right? But if you ask the question a different way, how much of the energy that is available here is actually captured in the form of ATP? And that's actually very efficient. 
it's at least uh, a third, probably as high as 50% of the available and available energy in glucose when you break it down to, to, to pyruvate or lactate by fermentation is released and captured to ATP. Uh, this is very high. By the way, you know, the energy conversions in, uh, in your car or something else is, is uh, definitely lower than this. Uh, it may be close to 25 to 30% at best. So glycolysis like, fermentation is actually extremely efficient. And you can make, keep making ATP very quickly. The metabolic flux, the amount of uh, material that flows per unit time through glycolysis is the highest than any other pathway. It exceeds 10 times more than protein synthesis, for example. And so you can get, you only get two ATPs per every molecule of glucose, but you can crank through a lot of glucose through glycolysis and get the ATP you need. Right. So that explains, for example, why muscles do it. Uh, yeast, why does it do it? I mean, yeast is, is it's a eukaryote. It has the same metabolic pathways that, that we do. Loves to do glycolysis. You know, the, what's the dream uh, of every yeast is to land on, on, a, on, on, a, on a grape and start consuming the sugar in the grape, extremely rich, and make more yeast, right? And that's, that's, that, that's all the, it cares about. So what yeast does, so it can definitely do oxidative phosphorylation. It does quite a bit of it, but it prefers to do fermentation. If there is glucose around, it would love to do just glycolysis and fermentation as opposed to taking all the glucose all the way through oxidative phosphorylation. And the product there, of course, is, uh, is uh, ethanol, which is a two-carbon unit. You get your two ATPs from glycolysis as the same, exactly the same reactions as you saw with muscle. And you get uh, one carbon in the form of CO2, and you get some water also. And it turns out that uh, glucose also fits the TCA cycle. If you do glucose and fermentation in some of the, uh, um, uh, let's say, your red blood cells, um, the glucose that is produced, uh, many of the tumor cells uh, kind of like to do this in the same way. So they prefer to do glycolysis and, and, and ferment it. And the reason is because maybe oxygen is not uh, available to them, but let me go back just a second because I think I forgot to tell you why this prefers to do it. So, all right, so what's the rationale here? It loves to do glycolysis and fermentation. You give it a little bit of glucose, it will just do fer fermentation. It will make ethanol and, and that's the end of it. And here's the cuts. If you are a microbe and you swim in a glucose-rich environment, there are other microbes around you, other species. So your task is not to be efficient at this point, is to really go crazy with the, consume all the glucose you can, um, get your ATP and, 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 and be happy. And the product now here is ethanol. The yeast is ethanol tolerant, all right? So the more it does, the more quickly it builds, it produces ethanol, the ethanol levels build up in the surrounding and the other competing microbes are not necessarily ethanol intolerant, so you, they, they get killed off. So you kill off the competition, you consume all the, the raw resources, you kill off the competition with the output that's ethanol, okay? And then what's pretty, pretty <laughs> sneaky here, that, that's sort of like the mafioso approach. You, you wipe out the competition, you, you consume everything. And then if you have to, if it runs out of sugars, what does yeast do is pick up the ethanol and actually take it now through oxidative phosphorylation, okay? And so nothing gets wasted. In the early stages, it prefers to consume all the glucose as fast as possible, uh, kills off the competition, and then picks up the ethanol and uses that too. All right? It turns out um, uh, uh, cancer cells do something very, very similar. In fact, in many ways, uh, tumor cells do behave like, uh, like yeast in preferring, uh, um, for example, glycolysis fermentation to oxidative phosphorylation. So, Perhaps because like yeast, tumor cells, their primary concern is not to, to be energy efficient. The primary concern is to, to make new tumor cells, to divide as fast as possible. So they care a lot about biosynthesis. So having the three carbon units and not take them all down to CO2, you know, through oxidative phosphorylation, maybe it makes a lot of sense because you can use them as intermediates in biosynthesis. Get the ATPs from, uh, from glycolysis. And if you need to, this is what tumor cells do. They take lactate also. They can pick up lactate and feed it straight into the TCA cycle. Okay. And just like yeast, they consume that too. So it's the same rationale. This was published very recently, 2017, in the most prominent uh, 
scientific journal in biology in nature and so again the similarity in the in the logic of why glycolysis and fermentation all right so fer fermentation for obvious reasons with the production of ethanol let's say alcoholic fermentation was of a keen interest uh, in humanity okay by the way not necessarily to make uh, alcoholic be beverages for uh, for enjoyment but you have to remember that until about you know 100 years ago or so there was no clean water or very little clean water available to to most people to most humanity so one way to sort of uh, disinfect the water as i described earlier is to to drink something like beer or wine so because of the ethanol level the competition is is is, uh, is dead so you have killed off uh, perhaps harmful bacteria and you enjoy drinking it too i guess so there was a um a really a, there was a big push by kings and everyone to actually understand how fermentation is happening um lavoisier also said you know that fermentation is a chemical transformation and kings uh, i forgot which one now uh, literally uh, offered gold prizes to anyone who can figure it out now pasteur in 1860 um found finally that the fer fermentation is carried out by cells by microbes by yeast okay but so this was done by life let's say a, an intact cell is a is a living uh, organism but how do you get to do it um, um, in a test tube so this was this is not easy and buchner here who uh, was the first one to actually uh, make it happen in, outside of a living cell in the test tube and the the the, the key here was to use extremely concentrated cell extract extra meaning broken up cells okay and you pack them uh, a lot uh, uh, in, a, in a test tube and then you could you give them glucose and actually now he saw production of ethanol after that so that was a, uh, a Nobel Prize in chemistry I believe it was the first one in chemistry uh, so he got to do it but the, but the significance is, is far beyond the ability to make ethanol now in a, in, in a test tube um, the significance is that uh, um, this is the first experiment that really made biochemistry possible what does biochemistry what do biochemists like to do to purify enzymes cofactors and substrates and so on and so forth and do these reactions and study them um, in uh, in vitro not in cells okay which is very difficult to do and once this was the first example that some key biological process, let's say glycolysis and fermentation, could happen outside of the cell. So then it becomes open to experimentation. And very quickly, within 20, 30 years, the pathway was figured out, actually. Because now you can start purify, purify, isolate different fractions and, 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 and study them in a test tube. Uh, the descriptions of these things uh, were not the same as we have today, for example, a heat and acid stable coenzyme of fermentation was uh, implicated in all these uh, uh, cell extras that could do fermentation now of course we call it NAD okay how good are the cell extracts uh today I mean I'm sure Buchner's was very low so if you plot the production of CO2 which is easier to measure let's say than ethanol in in live cells over time uh that's fermentation in living cells right it's extremely fast I mean so super fast if you, these are the best cell extracts of today so it's much worse than uh the actual situation in uh in uh, in, in living cells probably buchner's were like barely you know off the x-axis here it gets a little better if you get if you don't destroy completely the cells but you just permeabilize them so you maintain the general cellular architecture intact uh, the cells are dead so you can still do it in in, in dead cells so it's, uh, it's an in vitro system it gets a little better but still not even quite close to what living cells do right so clearly we have the higher order organization of all the glycolytic enzymes it's extremely important to, to get the efficiency of living cells so there is a lot to learn all right so that's the overall reaction we're not we're going to describe fermentation uh, afterwards but uh, the the Glycolysis itself, from glucose to pyruvate, is really a series of 10 reactions. Uh, we can call it a play uh, with uh, 10 actors, uh, the enzymes, and we can break it down in three acts, like every play has its parts. So there are three major parts. Um, 
But uh, first we have to, before we get to this part, we have to describe a little bit, I mean, just to remind everyone what enzymes do. If that's, you know, the reactants and the products and the total energy, you know, to get to products, you have to almost always go over a hump, the activation uh, energy that you require. And the enzymes, all they do, they don't change, you know, the reactants or the products. All they do is they lower this activation energy, right? And so that's what the enzymes do. And in general, in all of metabolism, there are five main classes of enzymatic reactions. So when we start describing enzymatic reactions, uh, we're going to put it in one of these five boxes. Is it a group transfer? We've already seen some of these, the, pho the phosphorylations, for example, okay, uh, that we discussed with ADP. These are, these are group transfers. We've also seen some of the electron transfers. These are the, the redox reactions, all right? What we have not seen and we will see are when you start moving pieces around on the same molecule, these are rearrangements, eliminations, so isomerizations. And very important uh, reactions are the ones that break carbon carbon bonds. Okay? I mean, we expect at some point to see one of those in glycolysis that breaks the six carbon glucose to two, three carbon units. And in biosynthesis, when we talk about anabolism, we're going to see a lot that, uh, so sorry, the reactions that break carbon carbon bonds, that's in glycolysis. In biosynthesis, we're going to see the reactions that make carbon carbon bonds okay, to stitch things together. So uh, the players, uh, I mean, the, the reactants here, you know, we can broadly classify them as nucleophiles and electrophiles, and they have re the, the reciprocal properties. Nucleophiles are electron rich. They're really actively looking for a nucleus. And they're often anionic. They have a negative charge. And the electrophiles are really the opposite. Okay? They, are, they, they have a deficit in electrons. They are looking for electrons, and they are often positively charged. So once, when a nucleophile is the electrophile, it will has it has the extra electrons. Not the electron rich uh, uh, nucleophile now will attack, and these are this is the I'm, I'm sure the arrows that uh, you've seen in your uh, in your in your chemistry classes, and we're going to use them also in, uh, in in this class. All right. So what are the three phases of uh, of uh, glycolysis. In the first one, almost nothing happens uh, We, in, in terms of uh, getting ATP or breaking down glucose. Uh, so we, um, I mean, there is going to be some breakdown of the very last reaction. So in phase one, we, we phosphorylate glucose, we isomerize it, so we, we rearrange it a little bit in some uh, form that can be used uh, better. And finally, in the very last reaction, we have the cleavage. Okay, this is where the carbon-carbon bond will, will break. Then in phase two, uh, we oxidize, okay, uh, so meaning that we remove some electrons and make some products that actually have enough energy to drive ATP formation from ATP. And in phase three, uh, it's very similar. The, the phosphate, the phosphoryl group is transferred now from one position to another and it forms another high energy compound that also has enough energy to drive ATP formation. So none of this happens in phase one. But in the low, in the upper part, so let's say of glycolysis. But in the lower part of glycolysis, this is where the ATP is made. Okay, so we're going to see all these phases in detail. Uh, another way to uh, to describe it is that the in phase one, we just it's a prep phase, uh, and in fact, we actually spend the ATP. Okay, the cells spend the ATP here, but then they set up the reactions they want in phase two and phase three in the lower part where now they can they can have a return of their investment. Here they invested the ATP and now they get it back, let's say with interest. In fact, they get it, they get it double, okay? It's a pretty good return. So we're gonna see all, this, uh, all these reactions in detail. And that concludes uh, this video. Thank you.